welcome to the Presto Music Podcast. The March edition of Gramophone magazine was unusual in that it featured reviews of complete cycles from both of the two titans of the Romantic Symphony, composers who are a regular fixture on disc and in the concert hall, but almost never appear together, Anton Bruckner and Gustav Mahler. The Mahler Cycle, a collection of recordings from the Berlin Philharmonic on the orchestra's own label, recorded in the orchestra's own hall, features a panoply of some of the greatest Mahler conductors of the past 20 years, including Sir Simon Rattle, Bernard Heitink, Claudio Abado, and a recording of the Sixth Symphony from their new chief conductor, Kirill Petrenko. The Bruckner Cycle is from the orchestra of Germany's second city, the Munich Philharmonic, conducted solely by the Russian Valery Gergiev, but was recorded under the spiritual gaze of Bruckner himself at the 11th century monastery of St. Florian in Austria, where Bruckner was an organist and where he remains to this day. Impressively, both of these reviews were written by today's guest. So who better to take a look at these composers and these recordings in the context of each other than one of Britain's leading music critics and the man who gramophone have on speed dial whenever another big box set lands on their door. Welcome to the show, Peter Quantrill. Thanks for having me, Paul. I imagine you've heard a fair few performances of these symphonies, both in concert and on record over the years, Peter, and the pace of new recordings continues unabated. How do you approach critiquing performances when it's now almost impossible to keep track of these works' discographies? Well, I'll answer your question in a slightly left-field way. I studied classics once, a long time ago, and I was told that a lifetime was easily enough to read every surviving text of Roman and ancient Greek literature. And that sounds incredible, but it's true. All it takes is curiosity. You'll find the time if you need to, because we do. And recordings of Mahler and Bruckner, in fact, still aren't anywhere near as commonplace as of Beethoven. Uh, You may recall that in the same issue of the gramophone, I also reviewed a complete cycle of Beethoven symphonies from the Concertgebouw. And actually, for the last five years, I've been thinking a lot about Schubert's great C major symphony. I've turned up old recordings. I've seen what new ones have to offer. Every few months, I go back. And I find there are another five or six recordings to listen to. If you want to become a great C major nerd, it takes a lot more time than becoming a Mahler 8 or Bruckner 8 nerd, in fact. And actually, what's important to me for Mahler and Bruckner, almost, I think, for any other composer, is keeping my ear to the ground for young conductors, live performances, new combinations of conductors and orchestras, which, of course, has been made quite a bit harder in the last year. Uh, now that we've all all been confined to quarters. I listen to a lot of foreign broadcasts because I love to hear this wonderful canonic repertoire evolving all the time. I love knowing the score and following the score, but the score doesn't fix the piece forever in my mind's ear. The nature of music as an art form, existing only in time, requiring realisation and interpretation, means that the performances are evolving all the time and hopefully our ears evolve with them so that we don't expect a performance today to do the same things that one that took place half a century ago. Sometimes our classical world, Paul, I think you'll agree, seems infected by nostalgia and a nagging feeling that things aren't what they were. But Kirill Petrenko doesn't have to be Furtwängler, and the musicians of the Berlin Phil don't have to live up to their predecessors. I talked the other day with an ex-principal clarinetist of the Vienna Philharmonic. He played with Bernstein, Carian, Kleiber, everyone. Yet he said quite candidly, The Vienna Philharmonic musicians today are every bit the equal of their predecessors. If anything, they're more adaptable than they used to be. Perhaps they don't play Schubert, or for that matter Bruckner, with the same unconscious absorption of idiom that they used to. But on the other hand, they play a huge variety of music, far more impressively than they used to. That was his perspective, and I think it's mine too. Now, Beethoven and Wagner were key influences on Mahler and Bruckner, but rather than focus on the differences between Mahler and Bruckner, what are some of the stylistic similarities, apart from the obvious fact that they both wrote long symphonies? Yeah, I wonder. I've been thinking a lot more lately how Bruckner and Mahler have elements in common to them, don't they? I think, first of all, of the dance impulse in their symphonies. We tend to associate the Lendler with Mahler as being a characteristic dimension of his symphonies and the middle symphonies in particular. Often Mahler symphony performances are defined by the success of their scherzo movements, five and seven and three. These seem to be the symphonies where an appreciation of the up and down nature of those movements, they're they're quite quixotic, they're capricious natures. 
the success of a performance is, is defined by those scherzo movements. But I think the same can often be true of Bruckner too, that we're coming to a realization that, in fact, you can't just set a Bruckner scherzo going and let it mind its own business. In fact, there's tremendous variety, the, the inner workings of those Bruckner scherzos. After all, we know very well that Mahler was a great supporter of Bruckner during the end of Bruckner's lifetime, when Mahler was a student. Mahler was present at the first performance of the Third Symphony in Vienna and uh, stayed to the end and was one of those ones cheering while there was a frantic crowd of booers <laughs> at the same time in the Musikverein. I think as well as the grandeur of their textures, there's this intense rootedness in an Austro-Hungarian, Bohemian culture where you can pile church music and dance music, popular musics. You can find them all piled in together. Actually, I think the same might actually be true of Dvorak too. What do you think? Yeah, well, for me, I think perhaps there's a way of saying that uh, both these composers are interested in big symphonic questions uh, posed by for the Beethoven Symphony, but I would say that Bruckner is a symphonic theologian because he doesn't question the central tenets as much, whereas Mahler is a symphonic philosopher because uh, he's much more willing to challenge those symphonic preconceptions. That's interesting, actually, because I think that Bruckner's symphonic architecture is often very novel in all kinds of um, subtle ways. I think that Bruckner got from Mendelssohn, perhaps, the idea of the third theme becoming increasingly important in a sonata form structure. That is to say, one of those great big slabs that make up the first movements, and in fact, the last movements of Bruckner's symphonic structures. Whereas previous composers, such as Beethoven, may do with two main themes, compare and contrast. In fact, Bruckner then introduces a third theme, and it's true I suppose, that he can often be quite episodic in the way that he deals with those structures. The fifth is a case in point. I think that's one of the reasons why the fifth is the most marmite of the Bruckner symphonies, that those of us who adore Bruckner's music perhaps adore the fifth more than any other. I remember hearing that Gunther Wandt loved the fifth and the ninth more than any of the other Bruckner symphonies, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I have to say... I'm with him there. <laughs> um, so I think that although Bruckner's symphonies do have the same four movements as Beethoven's, they're, they're novel in all kinds of hmm. subtle ways. Well, the Mahler is from the modern Philharmonie, while the Bruckner was recorded at the 11th century monastery of, at St. Florian, where Bruckner was the organist. Do you have a preference for certain acoustics for Mahler and Bruckner? I'm a bit of an acoustic sceptic, I've got to say. <laughs> I think that great performers carry their own acoustics with them. I think back to being in the Festival Hall, the Royal Festival Hall in London, when Claudio Abbado visited for the last time with the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, and he performed Bruckner's Fifth Symphony on two successive evenings, two of the great concert-going experiences of my life, really, I suppose. And I was astonished, so was everyone I knew who was there, by the additional resonance that Abbado found in that famously dry acoustic when he was there it was extraordinary, Paul. It was as though the actual resonance of the hall had expanded by even two or three seconds. Now, po possibly partly because he was using such a huge orchestra, much bigger than, in fact, I've ever seen, even for Bruckner V, which famously has a, a fairly substantial brass component in order to render that magnificent peroration at the end with all its due magnificence. But then I might think about the London Symphony Orchestra under Sir Simon Rattle at the Barbican, another hall that's come in for its fair share of criticism, not least from Rattle himself. But in fact, the sound of that orchestra has, has improved out of all recognition since he started conducting them regularly. And through, actually, I think the simple expedient of putting the orchestra a little further forward in the hall so that there are only, I think, three rows of seats in the stalls directly in front of the orchestra as opposed to the five. 
that are still sometimes there when visiting orchestras come. And it's true that those orchestras sound more recessed. But I go back to the idea that great conductors and orchestras make their own acoustics and great musicians too. When Anne-Sophie Mutter and Janina Janssen play in the same hall, as I've heard them do on more than one occasion, it doesn't at all sound like the same acoustic. I always used to think that the Emerson Quartet sounded better in the Queen Elizabeth Hall than the Wigmore Hall, but it was the other way around with the Tokash Quartet. A lot of quartets and pianists don't get to grips with the Wigmore acoustic, even after performing there many times. They don't seem to know that they don't have to project nearly as much as they expect. Even, I think, the same is true of the Royal Albert Hall, I'm reasonably familiar with, and I think you are too, Paul, as a, as a fellow prommer. And, of course, the forces that Bruckner and Mahler were writing for, they do demand a certain space, a space that's more like the Albert Hall than the Barbican. But I think we lose a lot as listeners if the textures aren't clear in those marvellously detailed scores, and the performers lose out too if they're performing in a space where they can't hear each other properly. So just as performers carry their own acoustics with them, I think that very strong pieces do too. Bruckner's orchestration was probably shaped by his experience as an organist, with his divisions into blocks of tone colour. But to go back to your idea of Bruckner as a symphonic theologian, I think it's important to say that Bruckner wasn't writing these symphonies as sacred works. He didn't compose them with a cathedral acoustic in mind. And the performances that took place during his lifetime almost exclusively did so in concert halls and not churches. I love Gunther Wandt's recording of the 8th and 9th symphonies from Lübeck Cathedral, but I, I don't think that the setting plays more than an incidental part in the success of those performances. It might be that the unusual setting inspires Wandt and the musicians to give even more of themselves than usual, I don't know. You'd have to ask the members of the North German Radio Symphony Orchestra who were there. Overall, I think a lot of fuss is made about acoustics. I think they're much more important for musicians than for listeners. I don't think it can be stressed too much that musicians have to be able to hear each other and that the hall they're in should accommodate as much volume and detail as possible, even if making allowances for one often compromises the other. I happen not to believe that most of us listeners can distinguish the finest nuances between hearing the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra and Symphony Hall and the CBSO at the Barbican. I think many of the differences that we think we can hear are down to context, physical space, the hall's reputation, our mood that day, how hungry we are, or whether we've had a drink in the interval, that kind of thing. Nonetheless, you have picked an almost scientific experiment, Peter. Can you introduce the two excerpts of Bruckner's Fourth Symphony, one recorded in Munich's Gastei Concert Hall and the other at St. Florian with the same orchestra and the same conductor? As much as anything else, I think that they're remarkable for the similarity of the attack that Gergiev seems to cultivate in these two excerpts. I think he has, as most conductors do, a basic idea of the piece which evolves little through time. And it's true that in this particular case, the performances were recorded, I think, by largely the same engineering teams and within three years of each other. So you wouldn't expect that much of a difference. And Gergiev isn't one of those conductors whose approach to a particular piece seems to evolve markedly over time. But I suppose I wanted to show that, in fact, Cathedral Bruckner does not have to sound as though it's cloaked in some kind of mystical aura, that it has to be uh, surrounded by a hallowed acoustic. If anything, I think the details and differences between the two performances are more to do with Gergiev and the orchestra coming to know each other better and to do with Gergiev perhaps coming to know the whole symphonic output better. After all, by the time he was conducting the fourth in St. Florian, he'd already conducted several other of the symphonies within this Munich Philharmonic cycle. So it might be worth hearing, first of all, the performance recorded in the Gasteig 
and then the second one at St Florian. Did Bruckner ever make any indication of what acoustic he wanted his symphonies to be performed in? I'm not aware that he did, but the successful performances that took place during his lifetime, and actually this is where the box set is well worth acquiring, as opposed to the individual volumes on the Munich Philharmonic live label. The box set has a video documentary, where not only Gergiev and then if for the later symphonies Kent Nagano goes through one or two points of interest about the symphonies themselves, but they have an actor reading contemporary reports, uh, quite amusingly so, in fact, of how the symphonies were received. And we tend still to think that brickbats were thrown at these symphonies one after another rather than roses. Actually, the newspaper reports that are quoted show that Bruckner's reception during his lifetime was by no means as negative as all that. We know famously that the seventh was well received. I think one of its very early performances, if not its first performance in Leipzig. But the some of the earlier symphonies when they were performed, even if not that infamous performance of the third in the Musikverein, they won acclaim and perhaps we have been too ready to remember the words of the critic Edward Hanslick, who after all was immensely influential in his own lifetime. After all, <laughs> Far be it from me to say that uh, critics should have an influence <laughs> over the reception of works beyond the listeners themselves. It seems to me that many audiences responded to Bruckner's music, uh, and they did so, as I say, in concert halls and not churches. With regards to Mahler and acoustics, has the desire to perform Mahler symphonies in concert had an influence in how concert halls have been designed in the past 50 or so years? Is how a hall now sounds in Mahler the gold standard for acoustics? Well, that's a good question. You would have to ask an acoustician, I suppose, <laughs> or, or perhaps someone like Rattle. I, I get the feeling that um, symphony hall... After all, it was baptised, wasn't it, with a performance of the Resurrection Symphony, the piece that was so very much associated with Rattle in the first, at least the first half of his career. And it's true that those symphonies do stretch, test out a large symphonic acoustic as much as any other repertoire. Though more and more I come to hear the influence of Berlioz, on Mahler's orchestration, on his feeling for symphonic narrative too. It seems to me that the second symphony could not exist without the example of the Symphonie Fantastique. After all, Berlioz subtitled the Symphonie Fantastique episodes in the life of an artist, didn't he? And I'm not sure what more explicit de description you could find of Mahler's symphonies than episodes in the life of an artist. I think Mahler, as a marvellous conductor, took Berlioz's example very much to heart and to mine when writing his symphonies and I think that the spatial dimensions of the second, the offstage brass bands, the response of the oboe to the flute in the finale of the second, for example, wouldn't exist without the example of the Cénochant in the Symphonie Fantastique. So, sure, you could certainly hear Mahler's symphonies as object demonstrations of how well a symphonic acoustic can sound. But on the other hand, I think that Berlioz is the real game changer in that regard. The Symphonie Fantastique has its own notable progenitor 
in the Pastoral Symphony of Beethoven with its very subtle textures in the second movement, the scene by the brook. I have to say that if I'm trying to judge an acoustic, then trying to hear the solo muted cello accompanying the violas in the slow movement of the pastoral symphony if i can hear that and i there's only one or two two times in concert that i ever have been able to once recently with yurovsky and the london philharmonic well now my goodness then i know that a conductor an orchestra and a hall are working in harmony i suppose in that case paul i would say that all roads lead back to beethoven yeah. it's it's symphonic theater isn't it Rich berlioz was so inspired by the theater himself that he created a kind of symphonic theater which then Mahler took up as you said with all these effects i think that's absolutely right now Mahler's scores are some of the most detailed in the symphonic repertoire yet performances still vary greatly in all sorts of ways are some conductors taking liberties? And is there more scope for interpretation, in quotation marks, in Mahler than in Bruckner? Yeah, that is such an interesting point, isn't it? That these scores sometimes, I think, cause conductors to tear their hair out talking to them, <laughs> in that there are ferociously detailed articulations of string and wind parts. I go back to the point Mahler was widely acknowledged as really the greatest conductor of his day, possibly rivaled only by the other preeminent composer-conductor, Strauss, someone else who knew a thing or two about orchestration, I suppose. I think, though, that these days, influenced as much by the historically informed performance movement, conductors do take more notice not only of Mahler's textures and how to render them as, in inverted commas, faithfully as possible, but they adhere to a certain window of tempi. And I think that's not a bad thing. I know that there are listeners out there for whom the supposed homogenization of interpretative approaches and of orchestral sound only shows that Mahler is becoming subject, like other areas of classical music, to a kind of supermarket mentality where everything is packaged up nice and neatly. I think that's not fair on some extremely intelligent, inquisitive performing musicians who seek to get ever closer to the secrets of these wonderful scores. I think that's notably true of the later symphonies of Mahler, the sixth, I suppose, which is, after all, the most classical of them, I would say, big statement. Uh, Agreed. Not only with its exposition repeat in the first movement, and its andante that should really flow rather than come to a sticky standstill. And I think that lots more performances of the andante these days do flow, as opposed to seeking some kind of artificial contrast with the pathos and the intensity of the outer movements. I would say that the second, this is purely a personal viewpoint, by the way, I, I, it's not backed up by any kind of data. My observation, though, is that the second is more and more treated as the kind of demonstration piece that you talked about in your last question. The idea that the second is a piece rather like Beethoven 9 to, say, inaugurate a hall or to mark a great event. Yes, yes. And, and one understands why with its resurrection narrative, its use of a choir, um, its great uplifting message. But I feel that actually performances of the Resurrection Symphony have slowed down a great deal over the years. If we go back to Stokowski and in fact Klemperer, that supposed notorious slow coach who in fact was not at all a slow coach in so much of the repertoire that he conducted, we will find that performances from the 60s, 50s, even into the 70s, are much closer to the tempo markings, or at least the durations that we understand Mahler took himself in conducting the Second Symphony. And I think that that might be to do with a certain sentimentality, a certain grandiosity of approach, which doesn't seem to apply so much to the later symphonies. I notice that the seventh, more and more, is tautening. And again, I think, in a good way. I'd like to think that more and more conductors such as Rattle on that marvellous performance, really so detailed, so full of decades of accumulated experience. I think that Rattle more and more hears and shows us an accumulated history of music in that piece. 
I'd also like to think that the Eighth Symphony, which was in fact the years treated, if at all, with the kind of kid gloves or the kind of celebratory aspect that the second is treated now. And here's a quick sampling of Mahler's Seventh Symphony, conducted by Sir Simon Rattle with the Berlin Philharmonic. Here's the opening of the scherzo. Now, Mahler famously declared that the symphony should be like the world, but is there too much sheen applied to Mahler performances these days that overlooks the music's earthier qualities? And similarly, with Bruckner, is his music approached by performances and audience as otherworldly, which downplays his use of Austrian country dancers, such as the Lendler? Well, I would say, to echo the thrust of the way that we've been talking about those two composers up to this point, oh, I am very interested in the way that even if not especially the really great orchestras do bring a certain earthiness to their performances of this music. I don't think earthiness has to mean inaccurate entries, for example, <laughs> or sloppy intonation. I'm not suggesting that youth were saying that, Paul. But I would say that the, the sound of the Berlin fill on this new set just goes to show what a superbly adaptable orchestra it is, that yet at their core there is a very dense string sound coming from the bass upwards, which especially in Mahler's long adagio movements, say the third and the ninth, lends an earthiness, a sincerity to this music, which frankly I find very moving, even if it's perhaps more polished than earlier performances. I don't find that, for example, the famous Vienna Philharmonic performance of the ninth with Bruno Walter that took place just before the Anschluss, I don't find that more moving because of the many orchestral slips that you can hear in the recording. I suppose I find it moving as a document of history as much as anything else. Though I am, of course, extremely impressed by all the subtle negotiations of tempo that the Vienna Philharmonic and Walter, who feel very close to this music in its own time, I suppose there's a sense in which we are inevitably more distant from Mahler than Walter was. And so perhaps it could be said that conductors and orchestras have to replace that almost unconscious intimacy with a kind of learnt technique. But against that, we could listen to the use of portamento that we find coming back in many orchestras. For decades, portamento was a bit of a dirty word, wasn't it, in symphonic <laughs> repertoire? And yet, we now understand that for Elgar or Mahler, for all the Romantic composers, they expected their music to be played with slides between some of the notes. And I think that many orchestras, many individual orchestral musicians, after all, have relearned that and have been encouraged to do so by conductors with a greater familiarity, with a sense of style in this music that doesn't just come from reading the score, but comes from an appreciation of its context. And I suppose I would say that all of this, again, goes back to the historically informed performance movement, which really got going in the 50s and 60s but, of course, took a while to make itself manifest in performances of the Romantic repertoire. To take that example to extremes, we could look at the Bruckner recordings not only made by Sir Roger Norrington and the Stuttgart Radio Symphony Orchestra on Hensler, 
but actually the portmanteau cycle on CPO made by Mario Venzago, which contains some extraordinarily odd tempo choices and, more interestingly, art articulations of the different kinds of music in Bruckner, of the chorale elements, the song elements, and the dance elements, all made very distinct, whereas we were used, until quite recently, to an approach which tried to find a symphonic thread through these huge works tried to construct them as huge edifices, perhaps somewhat at the expense of the, in fact, incredible heterogeneity of the material inside them. Does that make any sense? Yeah. I mean, do you think conductors are perhaps more happy these days to let orchestral musicians indulge in their own portamentos than rubato? Ooh. Um, I do think that uh, the balance of power has shifted, <laughs> shifted. between orchestras and conductors but that's a rather wider question i suppose that Mahler, in particular is a very good example of how power dynamics in orchestral politics play out it's, it is probably possible to hear greater individuality of phrasing in Mahler performances in u.s and english orchestras than perhaps it was 50 years ago and that might be to do with the way that conductors simply can't get away with at least on the surface of it being the kind of authoritarian autocratic martinets that once they were that there can perhaps nowadays be more of a sense of these works as manifesting a kind of collective endeavor but at the same time Mahler actually Bruckner too these things these pieces are conductor's music, aren't they? At least that's the way they're still marketed. That's the way we still buy them. That's the way I think we still instinctively think of them. The Berlin Phil might be changing the way that we are coming to think about this kind of music with their portmanteau cycles. Actually, likewise, the Concertgebouw, they have produced not only the Beethoven cycle I referred to earlier, but some years ago they produced a Mahler cycle on video. And I like the idea that orchestras, for different reasons, many of which I think boil down to money anyway, are producing sets of this music which reflect their own collective personality in this music. Whether that's a sign of the times or whether it's an economic imperative, I couldn't say. Yeah, I believe you have an example of how the Berlin Philharmonic has changed how it plays Mahler with two recordings that it has made of the third, the first from Bernard Heitig in 1990 and the second with Dudamal in this box set. As I think I observed in my original gramophone review, the Berlin Phil had been playing this music only with any degree of regularity, I would say, since the tenure of Abado. They, of course, did play it under many conductors before that, but only selectively under their long-standing principal, Karian. And the, the example of the third under Bernard Heiting, a Phillips recording, they made their first recording of the third as recently as 1990. And I think you can still hear there an approach to this scherzo music that ultimately is shaped by a concern for legato. Phrases don't exactly tumble into each other, but they're long. They are lusciously joined one to another. I'm not saying that there's any shortage of local character. Uh, in fact, I'd say that the local character is uh, just as piquant as it is under Dudamel. But I think Dudamel uh, brings a bit more air into the textures. I do think that he encourages the individual woodwind soloists to phrase more personally. Does that actually impart more character, more atmosphere to the symphony as a whole, to the movement? I'm not so sure. I get the feeling with Heitink's recording, at least of the scherzo, that there's an extremely strong atmosphere. We're in the woodlands with Mahler, thinking back to his childhood just as we so often are in these scherzo movements. I don't actually get that sense so much with Dudamel in this particular case, or actually in the fifth in the same set. These, for me, are paradigms, exemplars of Mahler symphony performances as concertos for orchestra, if you like. I don't wish to damn them with faint praise in that way. Dudamel and the orchestra clearly have an excellent relationship. They all know what they're doing. But I do miss 
what inevitably is somewhat indefinable, which is the atmosphere that I'm talking about, the way in which the symphony's world is created, actually from the outset with that marvellous trombone solo. There is, I suppose, to go back to one of your earlier questions, a sense in which sometimes the unique world of each of the Mahler symphonies can often be sacrificed on the altar of orchestral colour brilliance. Does that happen more frequently than it did 40 years ago? I w wasn't listening to lots of concerts then, so I couldn't say. <laughs> OK, well, let's have the opening of the scherzo from Bernard Heitink and then from Gustavo Dudamel, both performed, by, of course, by the Berlin Philharmonic. Do Mahler's symphonies benefit from a greater variety of approaches from conductors like in the Berlin Philbox? And as a corollary to that, do Bruckner's benefit from a singular conducting vision like the cycle from Gergiev? The obvious heterogeneity of Mahler's symphonies tends to encourage us to listen to them in that way. Though I think that much as I was saying about the subtleties of the individual forms of Bruckner's symphonies, but I think that when we look under the lid of the nine numbered symphonies of Bruckner, they do actually require a subtly different approach, evolving one to another. Once upon a time, a great Bruckner conductor could become known as a great Bruckner conductor for conducting the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth. Certainly the fourth, because that was what was commonly programmed, and of course the fifth for the sake at least of record collectors. Back in the day, the fifth was much less frequently performed in concert, I think, at least in English-speaking countries. I think if we're talking about this species, this animal of great Bruckner conductor, we might very quickly think of Gunther Wandt and Sergio Celibirake. But I seem to recall that Wandt called the first symphony a sick piece, <laughs> even very strong but then he was a man of strong words and certainly Celibidake if he ever performed the first two symphonies he never left recordings of them I mean recordings were never made of him doing them rather because of course he famously hated the uh, very concept of studio recordings or at least said he did he said a very great many things some of, several of which we shouldn't really trust I don't think but the point is that they made their name as great conductors through conducting the symphonies from number three onwards. And really, even then, I don't think that they conducted the third with anywhere near the degree of frequency that they did four onwards. And meanwhile, I think a new generation of Bruckner conductors, again, 
influenced by the historically informed performance movement, does approach the cycle as an entity coming at it from Bruckner's early study with the Viennese theoretician Simon Sechter, who notably also gave classes to Schubert in the last years of his life. That shouldn't in itself make us think that there's a common thread between the two of them. But I think that the upper Austrian rhythms of both Schubert's late music and Bruckner's early music do form a common ground that we hear more and more in performances these days. And I think that that has a positive impact on performances of the later Bruckner symphonies. Uh, I think that we understand the very strange otherworldly parts of the eighth and the ninth much better when we have got to grips with the often curiously hollow textures that can be found in odd corners of the first and second symphony. And I think that to a degree Gergiev is aware of that too. I do get the feeling that Gergiev has approached the nine symphonies somewhat as a single entity rather than appreciating their many diverse and odd qualities. I'm not sure that this is the set I would give to someone who was prone to thinking that Bruckner wrote the same symphony nine times. Yeah, I do think that Bruckner benefits from a variety of conducting approaches, both to the individual symphonies and to the cycle as a whole, or rather we listeners benefit from a huge variety of those approaches. Yeah, well, let's sample uh, the scherzo from Bruckner 9 first from Gergiev and St. Florian. Then let's sample it from Gunter van der Lübeck Cathedral in 1990. Yeah, I was, wasn't fortunate ever to see uh, Gunter van perform live, uh, slightly before my time, sadly. Uh, but even on record, he really does have quite a special way with Bruckner. I, I've heard a story that he was once asked by an orchestra to perform Bruckner, and he said he demanded an extraordinary number of hours rehearsal, but the orchestra agreed. And then just before he signed on the dotted line, he said, ah, but who was the last conductor to perform this symphony? And having found out, he said, well, then I must need, I need twice as many hours rehearsal <laughs> so that he could unlearn... <laughs> the orchestra from the previous one and then teach them how to do it properly as he thought <laughs> again van was a, a man of strong words uh, certainly uh, there are a lot of good stories about him i think if you uh, go back to the late john drummond's autobiography there are stories of encounters with van which might make one one's hair stand on end uh, he certainly brooked no opposition and he was i suppose in some ways one of those old style autocrats but I think he had, particularly with the North German Radio Symphony Orchestra, and to a certain extent with the BBC Symphony too, he won their trust. I was told of the last time that they appeared at the Proms together, 
I was fortunate to be present, but I was told that afterwards every single member of the orchestra, of their own accord, I rather believe, went backstage to the dressing room to personally say thank you to Vant. And I think that to a degree, their international reputation was quite largely made by their recordings with Vant. So I think that they did feel that they owed him something more than the performances that he gave with them and that they could tolerate a certain amount of podium dictatorship. Now, for me, one of the most keenly awaited performances in the Mahler set was the performance of The Six from their new conductor, Kirill Petrenko. That sampled the Andante slow movement, and then Peter can tell us what he thought stood out about the performance. Well, there is a lot that stands out in this, I think, Paul, isn't there? The freshness, the lightness of articulation, the, sen- the songfulness. Uh, I think if you were to compare this to uh, even the recording made live with Claudio Abbado a few years ago on Deutsche Grammophon, and then, of course, further back to the, the recording they made, a very famous recording with their previous chief, Karian, also on Deutsche Grammophon, then you find a almost a digest of approaches, a changing approach to Mahler over the course of the last half century. Uh, one in which Mahler's debt to Haydn, as well as to Beethoven and Berlioz, becomes ever clearer. But I don't think that Petrenko so much permits his individual soloists' liberty in quite the same way that we were talking about Dudamel and the woodwind players in three and five, and as indeed you might find in some of those other early symphonies. I get the feeling of a tremendous coherence of approach, of everyone pulling in the same direction. And also, more widely, and this is again where everyone needs to listen to the performance for themselves, of an overall vision of the sixth that is always pulling towards the finale, as any great performance should. And even then, pulling through the finale, so that we don't find ourselves, as we sometimes do, I think, in recordings of the sixth. I remember as a teenager first encountering the sixth and thinking, half an hour for an, just a single movement. <laughs> That's longer than most classical <laughs> symphonies. How on earth am I going to get my head around it? And then immersing myself, swimming in this all this intense narrative in these heaves and swells of emotion tremendously passionate they were too and this was Mahler that spoke to me intensely directly as a teenager but at the same time I feel now that the sixth deserves a bit better than that that in fact it does behave or it can behave according to certain time-honored symphonic principles and then when it does actually the force of its expression can come over all the more directly this is one of those examples where structure and an awareness of structure doesn't actually inhibit emotion that we don't just have to think about the most intense performances of Mahler being the ones time-honored ones famously conducted say by Bernstein the let it all hang out style though I'm going to contradict myself there and say that in fact Bernstein as a as another superb composer conductor understood exactly what he was doing and where he was going with the forms of these pieces as well as the their highs and lows their peaks and their troughs but i would say that the emotional landscape of the later Mahler symphonies has by no means been 
minimised in more recent decades by a more classical approach to them. I don't know if you agree. Yes, definitely. I think the most remarkable thing about the six is that it, it works when it marries that classical structure to the emotional extremes. Yes. And actually, there's a an, another notable predecessor there when I was talking about previous Berlin film Marla Sixes that I, I, of course, scandalously overlooked. And that's their previous chief, Rattle, who, of course, said both hello and goodbye to the Berlin Philharmonic with that very symphony. I wonder curious, if that, curious choice. <laughs> well, I suppose it would have been a curious choice as an adieu to his directorship of the Berlin Philharmonic had it not been for the fact, as I say, that in the mid-1980s he said hello to them with it. And I suppose there's a certain neat Marlerian circularity to his choice of the piece. And in fact, I do think that the Berlin Philharmonic's set of rattle conducting the Mahler VI, both those performances the first and the last, is also well worth hearing, if you possibly can. It should be borne in mind that these performances, if you balk at the considerable price of the Berlin Philharmonic's own editions, they can also be sampled in their entirety at the orchestra's digital concert hall, which I always find invaluable anyway. I I find that the Berlin Phil Concert Hall, I think, is a model for how orchestras should be organising their activity, their outreach to listeners who are both connoisseurs and new to the world of music. You wrote in your review for Gramophone about how Bernard Heiting's view of Mahler has evolved over the years. Let's sample his recording of the Ninth Symphony in this set, and then Peter can try and explain how, as a listener and critic, his relationship to both these composers has evolved also. Well, I suppose we all have our own stories to tell with particularly the romantic composers if they come to us at a decisive point in our lives. And certainly I can, as I'm sure we all can, I remember my first Mahler and Bruckner records. I remember getting hold of LPs of four and seven because after all, four and seven were what one bought, were they not? Uh, uh, And I found the fourth of Bruckner in particular... A great puzzle. I really didn't know what to make of it. It heaved and swelled and it came and it went and there were many grand moments. I found the seventh under Klemperer with the Philharmonia easier to grasp. I have to say, though, that the key only really turned in the lock for me with Bruckner when I went back to that record store and bought the third with the Concertgebouw and Heiting. And all of a sudden, the magnificence of the music seemed to be held within a structure that I could understand. I suppose the motto theme of the third made it more easily assimilable to me. I was 16 at the time, and it didn't seem to have the kind of clouds of atmosphere that the fourth generated. Also, the slow movement of three moves forward with a pulse that I think can quite often be hard to hear in the fourth. Adagio of the fourth, or in fact, I think it's an andante moderato. Very hard to pitch emotionally, expressively. Very hard to get the the right pulse and to get the sense of gentle melancholy, which Bruckner then, I think, refines in the fifth. And then I remember coming across the fifth on the radio. Much easier then to hear the fifth on the radio than it was, in fact, to buy recordings of it. Because... I was still buying recordings on budget labels then, as most of us teenagers were, and the fifth didn't come on a budget label, at least not that I could find, and this was before I started frequenting the 
second-hand LP shops and picking up all kinds of odd things. I remember uh, the Vienna Symphony Orchestra with Heinz Walberg. <laughs> I remember here picking up a fifth just because it was so very cheap and then getting it home and then actually understanding why it was so cheap. <laughs> and um, that, I suppose, was one of those object examples which, again, started turning the key in another door, which was to the concept of interpretation, where these pieces could have lives of their own that weren't simply dictated by the sound that they made, but that came about through the interaction of conductor and orchestra. And then later on as a teenager, buying in a flea market in Hastings my first Furtwängler LPs. And that was when I first really understood that the difference that a conductor could make to an orchestra and to a piece and how a conductor could make a piece personal to themselves without making it an exercise in self-indulgence. And I suppose my sentimental education in these pieces, then as I grew up, became more and more shaped by the happy opportunity of hearing these pieces live, most of all at the proms each summer, because I lived near to London. And so day after day, I could turn up in the summer and go and stand in the same place in the Royal Albert Hall, a place I think you're familiar with yourself, Paul. Um, roughly eight rows back in the centre. Uh, this is terribly sentimental of me, isn't it? But what I learned from that was how different orchestras could sound. People might say that the Albert Hall acoustic is so indifferent that it would be hard to learn anything from it. But I can assure them that if you stand in the same place night after night, you hear the most extraordinary differences in the sound, the sound body, the personality of orchestras and conductors as they appear before you. And in fact, experiencing these pieces live night after night in a space and an acoustic, and perhaps just as importantly, an atmosphere that accommodated them, that also inspired orchestras to give of their best, it seemed to me. Well, that then informed the way that I went back and listened to my recordings. And so I found myself not actually thinking of the 50s and 60s as a golden age, uh, a lost age of expression and passion in interpretation that I can well imagine if one devoted most of one's energies to listening, say, to particular fields of Italian or Wagnerian opera, it would be possible to listen to recordings from then and then to hear performances now and to think, we don't have what we did then. In fact, at least in the field of Wagner, again, I would disagree because I think that the stream moves on and we must all dip into it uh, as it comes to us. And our ears change as we grow older. And why shouldn't we expect the performances of conductors and orchestras to change likewise? That there is only a very limited degree to which historical comparisons can be made. But most of all, we can use all of these as learning experiences to just love these pieces more. And I suppose a, a, another real sea change in my approach to these pieces came when in my 20s I began getting to know the scores. After all, I, I never studied music at university. I think, as I said at the beginning, I studied classics. But when I encountered the scores themselves, well, that opened up a whole new world of understanding to them where I could follow them and see, not just in a Beckmesser-like way, see which conductors had done this or which oboe flubbed that solo, which conductors chose to ignore this tempo direction or to elide those expressive markings. But to, I used the phrase under the bonnet earlier, to understand really how these symphonies tick. And I think that's another way in which I find that when you look at the symphonies on the page, Mahler's and Bruckner's, you understand that Bruckner's symphonies, whilst at the same time they may be organised in these great block-like ways, the woodwind writing in particular is so full of avian detail 
little twittering chirps and squawks in the right hands that, in fact, Mahler's writing for them is just a stone's throw away. They were coming from the same world, I feel sure of it. And I suppose I've become less in love with the massive sonorities that drew me to these composers as a teenager. I think it was the case for lots of us sharing the sentiment of the character in Educating Rita who sticks on uh, the sixth, Mahler's Sixth Symphony, as I recall the Berlin Philharmonic Carrion recording, as you can tell with the DG yellow label going around on the turntable, and says, wouldn't you simply die without Mahler? The, the great waves of that music crashing over me, I, I, I felt likewise. Mahler articulated to me, to a degree, what it was like to even just be 16 and 17. Now, well, I'm not 16 or 17 anymore. (laughs) Um, And yet, at the same time, I find that the pieces speak at least as personally as ever. Um, Perhaps more of the composers themselves. I'm wary of treating art as autobiography. But I do feel that as we get older and we get to know the way that certain works tick, we start hearing why they were composed a bit more. And I think in the case of Mahler in particular, as a, con- as a conductor as well as a composer, you can start to hear all the other music that he was conducting, the slightly second-rate operas that he was conducting from very early on in his career, the reams of Dalbert, and, uh, all the operettas that he did. You can hear all of those being fed into the creative engine uh, of his symphonies and coming out at the other end. The, the more I get to know them, the more also I hear his symphonies speaking to his songs in a kind of dialogue. And so I start to hear the symphonies as often songs without words, even the, the great hymn-like stretches of the eighth. I've stood next to you on more than one occasion in a Mahler symphony performance, Paul. I don't know if you know what I mean about the dialogue of song and symphony in that way. Well, I, I personally, I just find these works so psychologically fascinating that they just re- reward... You're first attracted to them, as you say, as a teenager because they're long and loud and bombastic. But as you get to know them, they become they reveal new aspects of their character each time they're recorded in different performances. And that is what is so rewarding about them. So they just never seem to... You never seem to grow tired of them because they are so psychologically complex. I wouldn't say they were as psychologically complex as another human being, but they're perhaps, you know, (laughs) getting that way. Certainly. I'm so very much looking forward to renewing my acquaintance with them in the flesh, so to speak. I found it sometimes rather hard to deal with Mahler's textures whilst on lockdown Um, and also the slightly neurasthenic temperament. so often one can feel, particularly when listening to Mahler on headphones, it, sometimes that music can get into your head almost a bit too much. Much. Uh, whereas it's music that really deserves the space of a full hall, I think. But at the same time, of course, I've loved both these Mahler and Bruckner sets from Munich and Berlin. And I think that they are marvellously vivid proof of as you say, how these pieces renew themselves uh, over time and how our own ears can be renewed through listening to them. Absolutely, and I'm absolutely certain that our relationship to these composers will continue to evolve and change as a whole new generation of listeners, performers and conductors encounter this extraordinary music that continues to fascinate, excite and enthrall us. Peter's reviews of both symphony cycles can be read in this month's gramophone and of course both Mahler and Bruckner cycles are available to fly from Presto Classical. What reviews have you currently got in the works, Peter? As you mentioned, Paul, I I do like a good box set. (laughs) Um, And in fact, I've got uh, two Stravinsky box sets sitting on my desk. The updated complete edition from Deutsche Grammophon and the Warner Classics edition, which looks very exciting, actually, Mm -hmm. full of performances that have not often been reissued, including a really valuable historical appendix. Also, in the next issue of Gramophone, I'll be considering Stravinsky as a conductor of his own music. And I have to say that uh, returning to Stravinsky this year has been tremendously refreshing for the ears, (laughs) having just talked about Mahler as being a rather exhausting composer to listen to at home. I find 
Frankfurt, the, the absolute opposite is true of Stravinsky, that I can turn to any number of corners in his output and find, make new discoveries for myself in pieces that I thought I knew and indeed pieces that I'd rather forgotten about, I have to say. And the late music in particular inspires me afresh more and more and more at the moment. So my head's full of Stravinsky. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Matt Groom, for producing. And thanks to you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>